Good morning, everybody. My name is Ron Miller, and we are with our Door King webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about the 1601 barrier gate operators. Um, in the webinar format, you can submit questions by clicking on the question mark icon at the top of your screen. Um, we'll be going through our parking gate operator series including the 1601, 1602, and 1603. What we're gonna do is provide a, a short uh, review of the different models we have and, and the different ARM options. Then we'll be talking about some installation guidelines, things to watch out for when you're installing these systems, uh, how to set up and adjust the operators and some troubleshooting points. Uh, we should take hopefully a little bit less than an hour to accomplish this. The 1601 and 1602 series, our barrier arm series, have several different models available. These are continuous duty operators. They work on 115 volts. They do have a high voltage kit available if you have higher operating voltage. And we'll go through those, uh, how to install that a little bit later on in this presentation. The 1602 is a wishbone operator that uses either a wooden or aluminum arm and arm lengths can extend up to 28 feet depending upon the type of arm that you install. We also have our 1603 system, which we call the auto spike. This is a combination of a barrier arm and a tire spike, and the spikes are motorized. They work in conjunction with the arm. So when the arm goes up, the spikes go down. Typically, these are used in controlling vehicles such as rental cars, uh, parking lots, things like that. Another operator that we have coming out soon is our lane barrier system. This isn't quite available yet, but it will be released this summer. And what this does is goes one step farther and provides a barrier arm and a crash barrier. This is a solid steel barrier that raises up as the arm comes up and down. I have a short video that shows kind of how this works, how this operates, if you guys want to follow along here for a second. Again? Again, please? All right. So it's, it's something that we project to use in, again, rental car applications, air, applications where I need a little bit more security than just an arm provides. We also have a series of accessories for the barrier gates. We have in-ground spikes. These can be either weighted or spring loaded. We have surface mount spikes or in-ground spikes. And we also have uh, speed bumps that you can place on the lane to help control the speed of traffic. We have warning signs available. Typical warning sign, five mile an hour, do not back up. The other side of the sign says stop, do not continue, or tire damage will occur. And we have a red light, green light that can be attached to the parking gate operators. These provide a green light when the arm is at the up position and it turns red as the arm moves down and continues red while the arm is in the down position. One of the nice things about our 1601 operators, the single arm operator, is that the arm can, off, can come off either side of the machine. So I can mount the arm on either the right side or the left side, depending upon the flow of traffic and keep the doorway away from the traffic lane. There are various arm options for the 1601. We have a plastic arm, wooden arm, or aluminum arms. The aluminum arms can be uh, either a standard aluminum arm, a breakaway arm, and the lighting kit can be added to either the standard arm or the breakaway arm. We also have, if you're in a parking structure application, we have a folding arm kit. Uh, appears that this hasn't changed on your screens yet. The 
folding arm kit can be either a wooden plastic or aluminum arm and and the again these are typically in parking structures where i have limited overhead clearance along with the new arm designs we've added a cover on the arms to provide a, a little more finished look to the product an arm cover Uh, appears that we have a little bit slow down in the uh, network here. Another option we have for the arms is a breakaway arm. The breakaway arm can be set up to break in either towards the operator or away from the operator, depending upon, again, the direction of travel. It cannot break away both directions at the same time. You would set it up for either breaking towards the operator or away from the operator. And this is only available on the aluminum arm kits. Another option we have for the aluminum arm kits is a lighted arm feature. It appears our network connection's a little slow here. You're not seeing the slide changes. I apologize for that. The lighted arm kit is a, a strip of LEDs that mounts behind the reflective tape. And if I need to shorten the arm length, there are positions about every inch or inch and a half or so that I can cut that LED strip and not damage the lighting. So just make sure if you need to adjust the arm, you follow the marks on the strip that allow that uh, where to shorten the lighting strip. For the 1602 operator, we have either a wooden arm or an aluminum arm, and these are a wishbone arm design. They're counterbalanced with weights on the backside of the arm to balance that arm in operation. It's a three-piece assembly. You can get the wooden arms in 20 foot and the aluminum arm in three different sizes up to 28 feet. One thing I do want to stress on the parking gate operators is the requirement for pedestrian safety. One of the issues we see in our industry is people getting hit by arms as they're coming down. And it's very important when you set up any gate system that pedestrians have a separate way to enter the property without walking through the traffic lane. Now, one of the things you can do on a parking gate, you could put a reversing edge on the gate, or I could put a photo beam on the gate. Photo beams are great in that the arm does not have to hit something before it reverses. But the problem with photo beams has always been it makes it easier for cars to tailgate through the property. You want the photo beam to provide a reversing action if someone's standing in the way of the arm, in the pathway of the arm, but I don't necessarily want the photo beam to reverse when a vehicle is present. 
one of the things we've done is develop a loop logic for parking gate operators to tie in the photo beam with the down loop that would be underneath the arm. Okay. And the way this works, in essence, it provides a reversing beam for people, but not a reversing beam for vehicles. How do we do that? It's pretty simple, really. What we do is on our loop detector, our plug-in loop detector has an output for the down loop that plugs directly into the control board. Then it has a separate relay. We use the normally closed contacts on that relay and we run the photo beam through the normally closed contact. What that means is when there's not a vehicle present on the loop, there's a completed circuit between the common and the reverse terminal for the photo beam. When a vehicle is present, the relay contact changes state and it breaks the common leg of the photo beam. So the photo beam is now disconnected from the uh, reverse terminals on the control board. It's a way to provide that reversing contact for people, but not for vehicles. Pretty simple concept. The red light, green light option can be added to any of our operators. There's a relay on the control board that activates when the arm is in the full up position. Typically it's used to control a red light, green light, but I could use that for other things too. So it gives you a relay contact when the arm is at the up position. As soon as a down command is initiated, that relay switches uh, contact settings. So it would turn the light red actually a little bit before the arm starts moving down. It doesn't turn green until the arm has reached that full up position. Let's talk a little bit about installation on these operators. On installation, we're going to talk about placement and mounting of the operator, how to properly install the arm, some of the loop options, and we'll, talk, we'll go over some wiring and controls. You know, one of the things to think about on an installation, keep it simple. How is the arm going to go up? What type of devices are going to provide an up command? And then how is the arm going to go down? A down command would be the down loop. It could be the timer close. It could have both. You can have both the down loop and the timer close activated at the same time. Whichever occurs first would lower the arm. Now, mounting is pretty simple. On the operator itself, there's mounting holes on the inside of the operator housing. Use some sleeve anchors to secure that to the concrete pad. We, we recommend the pad be a little bit above grade to prevent runoff from running through the machine. Um, it's not absolutely necessary, but it's a good practice for installations. Try and keep the pad level. One of the things that's unique about our operator is how the gearbox works. The gearbox, the crank arm on the gearbox can run 360 degrees in both directions. So for example, it would go from the six o'clock position to the 12 o'clock position going clockwise to raise the arm. It continues in a clockwise direction to the down position to lower the arm. The next cycle, it runs counterclockwise. It'll go from the six o'clock to the 12 o'clock, from the 12 o'clock to the six o'clock. One of the things that's important when you're doing an installation, and this really should be set at the factory, but you should always check it, is when the arm, when you turn on the operator, make sure this crank is just below, before either the six o'clock or the 12 o'clock position. Doesn't matter which one it is, but make sure it's set up right there. There's a little bit of coasting that occurs. What I don't want to happen is the arm to coast past the 12 o'clock position or coast past the six o'clock position. And I'll explain that more a little bit later when we talk about arm installation. So if I need to move that, you can just move the pulley, the belt, to adjust that arm to where I want it before I attach the arm hub. Also, make sure you pull out the little plug that's in the breather hole of the gearbox. Uh, we plug it up during shipping 
to prevent oil from leaking out, but you want to pull that out prior to running the operator. Sometimes you'll see an installation where the arm is hanging down a little bit on installation. And one of the things you want to watch is making sure I get these arms level. And when they raise and lower, they're running 90 degrees from down to up. I don't want them going past 90 degrees and then bouncing back up. Sometimes you'll see that on installation. An arm coming down actually goes down and bounces back up a little bit. Or it goes up and then stops here, you know, bounces back towards the uh, down position. That's because of that operator, the crank arm, the crankshaft on that uh, gearbox. The other thing you want to do is make sure you install your hub with the mounting holes making a, a plus sign. All right, make sure this is straight up and down and straight sideways. You may have to try several positions, rotate that hub around, try different positions on the spline so I can get that straight up and down. I don't want to have it at an angle because that affects the movement of the arm. Once I install that, make sure you tie the locking bolt in screw it all the way in. Uh, you may have to readjust this after you run the arm a few times, take this uh, locking plate back out and readjust that bolt because after you run it a few times, it may loosen up and I wanna make sure that spline is nice and tight on there. Another thing, after I put the hub on, before I attach the arm, make sure you know which way is up. All right, inside the operator, there's an up switch. Toggle that switch, make sure that hub is rotating the direction you think up is, because I don't wanna put the arm on and have it go down into the ground and then come back up. There is a switch setting on the control board that can control which way is up. Once I attach my arm, again, we have, whether it's wooden or plastic or aluminum, we're gonna have a different arm bracket that attaches to that hub. There are slots in that, so I can make some adjustments, make sure that arm is level in the mounting there. One note on arms and warning signs. Um, Warning signs are a very important part of the UL safety codes, and there's warning signs on the operator and on the arm. If you fabricate your own arms or you purchase other arms, make sure they have the proper warning signs on it. It can help protect you from liability should somebody get hit by the arm. Once you install your arm and you're running the gate, you can toggle the gate up and down. Um, there is some fine tuning on the limit switches. The limits on this machine are actually magnets on a plate that rotates around the arm shaft. And there's two magnetic sensors. The top LED is the up limit, the bottom LED is the down limit. You can adjust the magnets, sliding them on this plate to make fine tuning on the arm to make sure it stops at the up and the down position. Once you install the arm, there's several dip switch settings that you can set up to run this machine. There's two sets of dip switches, a top bank of dip switches and a bottom bank of dip switches. And there's various settings on these dip switches that affect the operation of the machine. Let me go through a couple of these to, that are kind of important on when you're setting this up. Switch number one and people get confused about this, but it has to do with the down command from the down loop. Depending upon your application, you may find that cars, especially smaller sports cars, can zip through and clear the down loop before the arm gets all the way to the up position. The question is, do I want it to remember that down command and come down, or do I want to wait on that? This switch here, if the switch is off, the arm has to be all the way up before a down command will be acknowledged. If you turn the switch on, 
even if the car clears the down loop before that arm reaches the up position, it'll remember that down command and immediately cycle down. Gearbox travel is important. If you ever have an application where I need to stop the arm at less than 90 degrees, maybe there's a guard shack and the arm is gonna hit the roof if it goes straight up here. So I wanna stop it a little bit short. Then I need to turn off that 360 degree travel of the gearbox because the 360 degree travel, the arm would stop at say 80 degrees. Then when it goes to go down, it would continue up and then travel down. So I want to change the gearbox setting from 360 degrees to 80, 180 degrees. Turn that switch on. Now this gearbox is going to go up and down. Also, remember, how is the arm going to lower? You can turn the timer on and it can work with the down loop. It's whichever occurs first. So if I have the timer turned on and the, say I set it for five seconds, the arm comes up. If I don't get a down loop within five seconds, the timer would close the gate. If a down loop occurs in two seconds, that happened first, it would close the gate. So sometimes you wanna turn the timer on to make sure that the arm never gets stuck in the open position. On the second set of dip switches, um, the first switch is important. I need to set up, is it a 1601 or 1602? There's some differences in how we operate that machine. Then I have a multiple memory set of switches. Switch number two and switch number three are for multiple uh, up counts or multiple cars coming through the system. And I have two options here. The first option I'm going to call an override a down command or a second car option. And here's what happens. The first car would initiate a gate open command. As the first car passes through, it would be on the down loop when a second car activates the gate. If the first car is on the down loop when the second car activates the gate, we will ignore this down command and wait for another down command. This works good if I have a scenario with a card reader or a keypad or some type of access device in that the second car may be swiping their card and they're going to rush through. I want to make sure the gate stays up. It does not. It also works well with transmitters if a car is using a transmitter or remote control clicking their button when the first car is over the loop, it will keep the gate up. Our second option is called counting up commands. And this scenario works when I have an access device that's far enough away from the gate where I can get multiple cars stacked up in there. And the way this works, if I get one, two, three, four up commands, then I need four down commands before I lower the arm. I recommend this with keypads or card readers. I do not recommend it with transmitters because typically as people approach the gate, they're hitting their transmitter multiple times. I might end up with two or three up commands and the gate stays up for a while. Another option that you might want to consider is the stop arm function, switch number four. The stop function turns the down loop into a stop loop. So it really has two uh, functions. It provides a down command for the gate. If a second car is trying to rush the gate, when it gets on the loop during the down cycle, it would stop the arm. It doesn't reverse and reopen the arm, it just stops the arm. If the car, the second car were to give an open command, the arm would go up. If it backs off, the arm would go down. All right. And this is really important. If I have a scenario where cars are being hit by the arms, 
I might want to think about turning this on. Um, it makes it a little easier to tailgate, but it stops the arm during the down position. Now, if the gate, if the vehicle continues, the vehicle has hit the arm rather than the arm hitting the vehicle. Let's talk about wiring a little bit. Uh, it's typically a 115 volt machine. There's a power switch inside the machine that can turn the power on or off. Uh, black and white is neutral and hot. Make sure you're watching out your distance on the wire runs based upon the wire size. I always refer to the manual for the wire runs on this unit for incoming power. If I have high voltage input like 230 volt, 208 volt, 460 volt, we have a high voltage kit. It's basically a step down transformer. And the transformer comes with multiple plugs. And, and what you do here is on the plug that comes with the transmitter, you're gonna hook your incoming power. So if I have 208 volt or 230 volt, I'd use the 230 volt plug or the 208 volt plug. Hook up your incoming hot legs, plug it into your transformer, Coming out of the transformer, I have black, white, and green that run to your re regular terminal strip. The transformer mounts behind the circuit board. So I got to take the circuit board out. There's a plate that comes with the transformer that screws in here, and the transformer kind of mounts behind that plate. And then again, I have 230 volt power coming in. Plug in your plug to the input side of the transformer. The output side is black, white, green. That goes to your 115 volt terminal. This can be added on to any of our parking gate operators. Your main terminal strip is where all your wiring is connected. There is an LED associated with each of the terminals. So I have terminal five is 24 volt power. That's accessory power for like photo beams or radio controls. Terminal six is an up input. Terminal seven is either an up input or it's a reversing input, I mean, a, an output from my loop detector. A uh, question came in, do I have solutions for three phase power? On three phase power, I take, let me back up a slide here. It's a great question. On three phase power, if I have three hot wires, I take any two legs of the three phase and connect it to my transformer and cap off the third leg. So any two legs of that three phase power coming in would be converted, properly converted to the 115 volt to the machine. Uh, so again, uh, inputs here, six is an up input, seven is a second up input, or it can be the output from the loop detector. I'll cover that a little bit later on, how we might use that. Terminal eight is a down input or a reverse input, depends on if I'm using a down loop or a reversing loop. Terminal nine is always a reversing input. Terminal 10 and 11, are special contacts used for sequencing the parking gate to a slide gate or a swing gate. And I'll go over that in just a few minutes. Terminal 12 and 13 is a relay contact and the relay can be set up to work either with a down loop or with an up loop. So you have a choice. You get a relay contact whenever there's a car on the down loop that relay would activate or whenever there's a car on the up loop, that relay would activate. And then of course, I have my low voltage common. So if I'm looking at wiring inputs, a radio receiver, I'd have 24 volt relay in common would go to five, six, and 14. If I have some type of access device like a card reader system or a keypad or an access control system, that would go to terminal six and 14. A down input would go to terminal eight and 14. Make sure the dip switch is set up where terminal eight is a down input, not a reverse input. Uh, 
If you want to, we also sell a, a, a control that provides a momentary or a maintained contact. So it could be a hold open switch. Typically a guard shack might have this. Hold open would same thing, go to terminal six and 14. You just need a maintained contact there. The special inputs momentary up and enable up and the relays are used when we sequence this gate with a slide gate or a swing gate. One of the things we do often in multifamily is we'll use a sequenced gate operation. And the way this works, we run four wires between the parking gate operator and the slide or the swing gate operator. When an up command occurs, the slide gate will open, but the parking gate stays in the down position. When the slide gate reaches the full open position, that triggers the parking gate. So I'm not opening both at the same time. When the first car passes through, the parking gate comes down. Now, as long as the slide gate is open, the access device would open the parking gate for subsequent cars. So if I have two or three cars, they can each cycle through the parking gate. When the last car goes through, and it times out, once the slide gate times out and starts to close, then we turn off the parking gate again. It's a very simple way to provide a higher level of control for vehicles entering through a slide or a swing gate. If you need more information on that, look up, uh, we have what we call our PAMS manual, Perimeter Access Management System. And that provides wiring diagrams for the various gate operator interfaces, lane layouts, and more information on that. Let's talk about loop settings for a minute. Loop settings, loops are typically used with a parking gate to lower the gate. And the way it works, it's a make and break contact. So it's not a pulse on exit or anything like that. You wanna place the down loop directly below the arm. When a car passes over the down loop, it gets an input to the gate operator. The gate operator sees that down loop input and it says there's a car on the down loop. As soon as the car exits the down loop, I'm going to close the gate, lower the gate. Now remember, if I want this to be a reverse loop instead, I have a switch that says, is it a down loop or is it a reverse loop? If I have an arming loop, an arming loop would be where a vehicle has to be present before the card reader works. Then I would use our dual channel detector, a 9409. This has two detectors on one circuit board. Channel one, the down loop, plugs directly into the down loop port. Channel two, the arming loop, has a separate relay. So I could run the output from the card reader through this relay back to the up position. That means I need a vehicle present plus a card read to equal an open command for the gate. The exit loop, typically can plug into the up port on the control board. The exit loop is a, an open command. I can also set it up to work more like a typical gate where I'd have an up command and then a timer close. And in that case, I might wanna put two reverse loops, one on either side. I could also just have the one loop under the arm. Uh, we have another question here. Is there a link to download all the manuals? Yes, there is. Doorking.com. And when you go to doorking.com, uh, you can select uh, gate operators. And in there, there, there'd be all the manuals for the gate operators. Um, I'll show you that link at the end of the webinar here. Great question. And I recommend you have the down uh, the the manuals on a tablet. You know, when I go out in the field, I have a little tablet with me. I carry the tablet everywhere. It has all the manuals on it. I can always pull them up and look at them. Oh, and it looks like TSW says they also have 
downloaded all the manuals in their Dropbox. Now, after you install the gate and you set up all of the down loop, how you're going to open the gate, how you're going to close the gate, there's a few adjustments you need to make. One of them is the reverse sensitivity. This is a very important adjustment. Basically, how much pressure does it take to reverse that gate when the gate hits something? It, it might take you a few tries to adjust this, because remember, a parking gate arm comes down in about one and a half seconds. During the down cycle, I need to turn the reverse sensitivity pot clockwise very slowly, try it over several cycles of the gate until it, you get it to reverse the arm, then back it off about an eighth of a turn. What you should find is you should be able to, as the arm's coming down, if you reach out and grab that arm with your hands, it should reverse and go the other direction. I can make that very sensitive. However, if it's too sensitive, then things like windy days might affect the arm. So I don't want to be, you know, right at that threshold. I want to back it off about an eighth of a turn. Very important. Every time you go and work on a gate system, you should adjust this. Conditions change. People change the type of arms that go on there. An arm gets broken. Somebody at the property puts on their own arm. It weighs a little bit different. Maybe it's heavier. Maybe it's lighter. Make sure you're always adjusting this. And, and record that on your service tickets. Again, it helps you protect you when there's a liability situation. Other adjustments you may need to make. If you're using the timer close, I can adjust my timer close from one to 59 seconds. And there's not really a setting on here other than set it, cycle the gate and see how it's gonna work. And remember, set your dip switches based upon how you want the gate to function. We have two other accessories that you might use up in the in the northern climates. You might want to put a heater kit into the operator. A heater kit basically is keep the to keep the oil viscosity proper in cold climates in the gearbox. We use a synthetic oil that's rated to a very low temperature rating. However, in extreme cold climates, you start getting ice buildup on the arms, on the, on the mechanisms inside there. Heater kit's not a bad idea. The heater kit mounts inside the operator and attaches to your 115 volt power. If you're using 230 or 208 or 460, you can get a 230 volt heater and hook it up to that main incoming power rather than the you going through the transformer. We also have a fan kit and the fan kit really is intended more for extreme humidity uh, areas. For example, down in Florida, in Florida and in, in Mississippi and the Gulf Coast where they get a lot of humidity, it actually starts almost raining inside the operator. So the fan kit keeps it uh, dry and cool in there. Let's see, we have a couple questions here. Loop sensitivity. Yes, the loop detector has uh, several adjustments on it. There's a high, low, uh, high, medium, high, medium, low, and low sensitivity. There's also a frequency setting. Frequency is very important on detectors. If I have multiple traffic lanes working next to each other. I want to make sure the loops work on different frequency settings. Um, let me back up a couple slides here. On the detector, there's a light that comes on when you first power it up. When you first power up the machine, you're going to see a red light blinking. And it might blink three times, pause, and blink five times. That means it's tuned to 35. That's the frequency that it is tuned to. If I have two detectors, I want to make sure they're set up on different frequencies. So if this one's at 35, I want this one to be separated by at least five counts. So I'd want it to be like 30 or 40. So you may need to adjust your frequency settings uh, for that to separate those. There's one other function on a loop detector, it's called the sensitivity boost. And what the sensitivity boost will do 
when you set it up at a medium or a high sensitivity, when it detects a vehicle, say the sensitivity in simple terms is set at two, four, six, or eight. So high sensitivity is at eight. Sensitivity boost says when I pick up a vehicle, it jumps to sensitivity 20. So if I have cars and trailers or high bed vehicles, it tends to hold that call between the front and the back axle. Once the car leaves, it drops back down to wherever you have it set at four or eight or six. All right, so that's another thing you can do. Um, maintenance on the operator, you know, check for alignment on the arms, check your drive belts, make sure you, you may periodically need to adjust the tension on the drive belt. Always check your reverse sensitivity. If you have batteries on the operators, make sure the batteries are, are, are fully charged. Um, check your gearbox oil level. Typically, that's not going to be something you need to maintain unless you get a leak in the gearbox, which doesn't happen too often. Always check your loops for, for proper operation. Um, I have a question here again for a heater kit. The heater kit can run off of the 115 volt or 110 volt power that feeds the machine. That's fine. However, if you're going 208 or 230 volt power, make sure you get a 208 or 230 volt heater and run that from the incoming power. Don't buy a 115 volt heater and run it through that step down transformer. Um, I had another question here. Maybe I, I missed it somewhere about the the highest level of sensitivity. Remember something on loops. Let's um, let me do this. Let me let me pull up a, a, our loop guide that we have. Give me just a minute here. I'll talk a little bit about loops. Because loops are an important part of, of a gate system installation. Oh, I need to... Uh get to the later part of this. This is another seminar we do on gate operator installation, but we have a section here on loops that I think would be helpful to you guys. You know, whenever you're talking loops, whether it's a down loop or some other loop on a gate system, it's important to understand how loops work. Basically, a loop is a coil of wire in the ground and your electronic detector. The height of detection is directly related to the size of the loop. If I picture that the current flow is going, say, in a clockwise direction around this loop, um, let me let uh, my, my network catch up here. So when you're in a clockwise direction around the loop, as it's going around the loop in a clockwise direction, it's moving in opposite directions on the long leg of the loop. That provides cancellation. So the short leg of your loop is really what determines your height of detection. And typically you're gonna get about one half to two thirds of the short leg of the loop. The fields of sensitivity are like donuts of sensitivity that surround the loop wire. So if I had a loop that was four foot on the short leg, I'm gonna get about 24 to 30 inches in height of detection. If I had a loop that was six foot on the short leg, I'm gonna get 36 to 48 inches in height of detection. So think about the type of vehicles that are passing through the gate. If you're putting in a down loop, that's a four by eight foot loop, the highest height of detection you're going to get is 30 inches. All right, that'll pick up the front axle, but it could easily drop out on a flatbed or a tractor trailer. 
if I have a lot of activity with larger vehicles, I need to put in a six foot loop on the short leg to make sure it will maintain between the front and back axle. Sensitivity boost will help with that, but the size of the loop is really critical in that scenario. Uh, let me see, let me get caught up on our questions here. Uh, hybrid vehicles. Will cold affect operation with the gate opening and a heater? Um, it, if you're, you're typically, um, I know Wisconsin where TSW is, it gets a little cold up there in the wintertime. Any operator with a gearbox, I would suggest putting a heater kit in. What tends to happen, even though it's a synthetic oil and it's rated to very cold climates, if it sits all night without running, the first operation in the morning is gonna be sluggish. What that can do is affect the reverse sensitivity and get that arm stuck in the open position. After the gate runs a few times, it might be okay. That's where that heater kit really comes into play. It keeps that oil viscosity um, easy enough to work in the winter times. Now, let's talk about troubleshooting on parking gates for a second. Always look at your LEDs. For example, if you're having a problem with limits, if the arm rotates up and then comes right back down, or the arm keeps cycling and keeps going up and down and up and down, make sure I'm seeing a LED at the up input and the down input. If I have this magnet adjusted wrong, it might not catch this input. So make sure you're seeing both the up and the down limit. Another troubleshooting thing, remember, to look for the LEDs for terminal six, seven, eight, and nine, the up inputs and the down inputs. If I have something plugged into terminal seven here and it's not creating an up command, you may have the switch set incorrectly. SW1 switch eight says, is this an input for raising the gate or is it an output from the loop detector? The output from the loop detector would be if I want my up loop to open multiple gates. Um, another issue that came up on, uh, on the chat that Alex mentioned here, very important, when you're putting in a, a heater kit, make sure that you're following the wire gauge size recommended. In the heater kit instructions, there'll be a, a recommendation on wire size for the supply voltage to the operator. And also make sure operators are on their own 20 amp circuit. Don't share power with parking lot lights or some other things. Make sure they have their own power circuit. If I get a scenario where the gate ignores the limits, and I've seen this happen sometimes, you'll see a video somebody sent me where the arm is just cycling up and down and they look inside and the, the limit LEDs are coming on, look at what's connected to terminal five, what's being powered from the gate operator. We've seen scenarios where you start powering things that have relays in them, like a, a lane counter or some other type of device, and that a mag lock or some other thing from the 24 volt power that starts affecting the, the microprocessor on the control board. So one of the troubleshooting things you would try is disconnect the power to your accessories and see if the gate functions properly. If it does, I might need to find a separate power source, power that accessory from a separate power supply. When you're testing the gate, one of the things I always recommend when we're doing troubleshooting, does the motor move the metal? Does the, the, the drivetrain of the gate operator work? Forget about all my accessories, my controls, my up inputs, my down loops, all of that stuff. Can I run the gate? And the way we do that is we hot wire the machine. I would pull off my wiring on my terminal strip. 
pull off my up commands, my down commands. You could even take out the down loops and the up loops. I just want the operator by itself, turn the power off, jumper terminal two to terminal three. Turn the power back on, that gate arm is gonna run up and down. There's no limits involved. It's just gonna run up and down. You can pull the circuit board out. I'm just looking at the terminal strip itself. Pull the circuit board out, jumper two to three, I'm hot wiring. What this is testing is the motor and the gearbox and the arms and the mechanical interface, uh, all the crank arms and, and mechanical interface inside the machine. Turn the power off, jumper terminal two to four. Turn the power back on, does it run up and down? That's just a quick test of the motor and the gearbox. If it doesn't run, you don't have a control board problem, you've pulled the control board out, I have a problem mechanically in the drivetrain. Once I set, if that works, then go ahead and plug in your control board and you can use your wire jumper or the switches to test the operator itself, test the control board. That completes our seminar. Um, hopefully we gave you some good information. We, we filled in some gaps on what you're looking for. Uh, are there any questions that I could address at this time? Have I answered the questions that you have? Um, I'll be happy to stay on here for another five or 10 minutes. If you guys want to talk things over and somebody comes up with a question, feel free to uh, throw it out there and I'll answer them. You might think like, oh, shoot, what was that question? Uh, again, if you want to, while I'm waiting for questions, if you go to doorking.com, and you click on gate operators, I can look up any of the operators that we have. Parking control would, where it would be where I'd find the barrier gates. I click on the barrier gate and under downloads, you can find all of the manuals. Quick start manual, installation manual, breakaway, lighted arm kit, folding arm kits, traffic light kits, heater kits, fan kits. We have all the literature, you could have all, all the manuals right there on our website. Do your manual show how to wire up two gates? So if I have a, a wide traffic lane where I need to have uh, two gates crossing that lane, yes, we show how to cross wire those machines. That's all the wiring and loop setup is inside those machines. Basically what I would do is I want run all my controls to one of the operators. And if you recall, I said that the relay output from the control board let me back up a couple slides here. The relay output 12 and 13 can work with either the up loop or the down loop. So I would set it up to work with the down loop and I'd ru run 12 and 13 over to the second operator. That would be my down command for the second operator and then tie terminal six in, which is my up input. But the manuals do show the wiring for multiple operators. I want to thank everybody for attending today. Hopefully this gave you some good information. Again, I'll stay online if any questions come in. And uh, if you need any uh, additional help, feel free to give TSW a call. They have very knowledgeable people in their sales and, and support department. They'd be happy to answer your, any of your questions. I want to thank TSW for sponsoring this webinar. And uh, we appreciate the business. Again, I'll stay online if any questions want to come in.
Oh, there's a great question from Alex. Can we get a copy of this video presentation? I actually did record the webinar, so we'll have uh, that available. Um, I'll have to figure out how to where I can post that. But yes, we will get this uh, available. If you have some employees that perhaps missed the presentation, uh, you'll be able to view it again. I will get that information to Alex over at TSW and then he can disseminate it to, uh, to the attendees here. If that's all, uh, again, thank you for attending and uh, enjoy your day.